There's a popular saying in leadership that if you think you're leading and there's nobody following you, you are only going on a walk. On this platform, you are going to learn principles of leadership. You are going to encounter different leaders. You are going to learn about how you can grow as a leader, how you can make an impact. My name is Samuel Ayim and I'm the host for the leadership platform. I am a leadership coach, a lawyer by profession, a John C. Maxwell certified coach. I have been in corporate life in senior positions for several years and now I run the Center for Transformational Leadership where we train and coach leaders to become better leaders. And I invite you to go on a journey with us as we discuss the subject of leadership in the coming weeks. This and every Saturday, you have opportunity to ask questions, share your views on important leadership matters. We spend a lot of time developing our professions, but we don't spend time developing ourselves. Look, as a leader, as a professional, you have to grow. You have to grow yourself. And to be able to grow yourself, you need to know yourself. A lot of us are not achieving the maximum we can achieve because we have not invested in our personal growth. So we are bringing you this special studies based on John C. Marshall's book, The 15 Invaluable Laws of Growth. And we're going to just spend time with you and help you go through the principles that you need to be able to grow your person, to become a better person. Because if you become a better person, you become a better leader, you become a better father, you become a better professional. Do not miss this opportunity as the masterclass is going to be very practical and discussional. It is going to be a limited number of people. So please register now to be part of the program. Um, hello, hello. Um, not sh hello. Can anybody hear me? All right. Hello. Good evening. Can anybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Sam. You're All nice. right. So thank you so much, everybody, for for joining this evening um i can't see myself but i hope you can see me um sarah can you see me abigail anybody can you see me yes i can see you all right okay I so um take care uh, thank you everybody another saturday is here with us and we have another great topic to be delivered by another great leader and we would encourage you, if you are just joining us uh, for the first time, or even this, you are, if you are a regular participant, uh, for those of you who have already connected, please introduce yourself. We are always happy uh, to have you. Just whether you are joining from Facebook or YouTube or um, any other means, please uh, introduce yourself. Let's have your name and where you are connecting from, and we'll be very happy uh, to to introduce you or to announce you to the world that you are here on the leadership platform. 
because we take pride in announcing all our participants and appreciating you because we don't take your participation for granted. Yes, we know we're going to help you. We're going to impact you. We're going to add value to you. And the speaker we have is going to really add value to you because we know you are, you are of value to God and to our continent, Africa. So we want to do everything possible to add value to you. So please introduce yourself and let's run. We are going to be together for about 90 minutes and um, we're going to have our speaker speak to us for about 30 to 40 minutes and we'll have maximum time for you to ask questions and interact, share your views. And please stay with us till the end because a lot of the time the critical lessons come when you share your views, when other participants interact and share their views. That is where we learn even more. We also know that some of you join and you don't introduce yourself. That's also fine, but we prefer you to participate, send your comment in so that we would uh, we would be grateful to appreciate you. I see already Martin in Siako Frando who has joined uh, from Accra. I see Phoebe has joined and um, I'm, I'm, we are very, very uh, grateful. Um, we want to encourage those of you who are already on to sign up to the uh, growth journey uh, the growth journey is a 15-week uh, group coaching program where we help you to focus intentionally on your personal growth and we guide you step by step so that you can look at your life again and develop a growth plan for yourself and we've this year we already finished two two uh, streams, two cohorts of fifteen uh, great, 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 great executives and entrepreneurs and others who have gone through. So we've worked through with fifteen uh, thirty people, and we are currently on the third stream. And we have lots of great people, architects, accountants, bankers, who are really learning and adding value to one another. So we encourage you to. Take advantage. It's very, very, very cheap because if you want to go do, do coaching one-on-one -on, -one on this, you're going to pay much more. You're pay, paying uh, practically $100 for two hours of coaching every week. And that is really very, very, very uh, good value for money. So please continue to uh, join. I see Christopher Gavo. Uh, he's joining from Koforidia. Christopher, we thank you. Ebenezer Tufo is joining from Abuja. He says, good evening to us. Ebenezer, thank you so much. Ama Vanderpoy, Ama, thank you so much for joining. Um, I have Samuel Ahiavi who is joining from Suhum. So, all right. So we want to thank all of you. Today, our subject is financial literacy for leaders money is so key to our lives uh, as individuals for families for businesses and for leaders our understanding of money and how it works is so important especially if you are a business leader but even so for your individual financial uh, planning uh, financial literacy is very important that is one of the areas where most of us are very, very illiterate. Um, we don't understand how money works. And that is one of the reasons that most of us are actually poor. We are poor not because we, we don't get money, not because money is not around us. We are poor not because we don't see money. A lot of us are poor because we don't have the awareness. We don't have the knowledge. We don't know how to make money, how to keep it, and how to use it. Um, and uh, one of the quotes that we share is that though we are literate in the 21st century, we are illiterate when it comes to financial literacy. Financial literacy is the only way to enjoy breathing fresh air to become financially independent. All right? And uh, Dave Ramsey who is an expert in financial management says, 
financial peace isn't the acquisition of staff. It's learning to live on less than you make so you can give money back and have money to invest. You can't win until you do this. And that is the motivation we all of us need to understand money. So we are grateful this evening to have uh, one of our great speakers and coach who is not a stranger on this platform. She's spoken every time we have questions about money. She comes, the last time she was on this platform, she shared with us some mistakes that uh, leaders make, uh, financial mistakes, money mistakes that we make. This evening, he's going to take that discussion a bit further, and he's going to talk to us about literacy, the fundamentals that we need to understand. Our speaker is Doris Ahiati, and Doris is the co-founder and CEO of Crescendo Consult, a financial advisory uh, service, and executive, she's an executive coaching and consulting firm. Prior to this role, she was the country director of the Association of uh, Chartered Accountants Global ACCA, uh, which is the leading global professional accountancy body. And she was also the vice president at Ghana's premier investment bank, Data Bank, where she led financial advisory and corporate finance research and founded the group's uh, uh, Penoxin business uh, currently well worth over 1 billion Ghana cities. So she knows, Doris knows something about money. Uh, she has extensive experience in investment banking and finance and was on the team of advisors to the government of Ghana for the issuance of the Ghana State Euro Bond, raising 1 billion on the international market in 2014. As far back as that was, she was involved helping government even to raise money. So you can be sure that we have, we have a great, great, great speaker. She's so passionate about helping people attain financial and spiritual liberation through knowledge sharing and people development. She is also a John C. Maxwell certified coach, trainer, and speaker. So um, it says so much about Doris. If I want to go through, it will take too much time. So we are happy to have Doris on the line uh, as we have uh, a few more people join us. Desmond Opon is here. Uh, Rose Odai is here. Teresa Sarikuma is here. And to say Vasco is here, Frank is here, Hajia Alima is here, and therefore, Doris, many, many more people are joining to hear you share with us. Thank you so much, Doris. We always appreciate you on the platform. You are very welcome. Take us away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samuel. Please confirm for me if you can hear me loud and clear. I can hear you very, very loud and clear, and I can see you. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. I'm you very so happy much. to be given the opportunity today to do something that I absolutely love doing and derive a lot of personal satisfaction from doing. And I'm also happy to know all the people on the call, including Hajia Alima, whose name you mentioned. So a very good evening from Accra um, to those in the GMT time zone and then elsewhere, I just want to say hello. And I want to congratulate you that you've taken the time to upgrade your knowledge, whatever level that you are at in financial stuff. And I'm, I believe that myself, I'm going to leave this session tonight with some new insights. So we are all going to share in the learning experience this evening. And let me recognize the Center for Leadership Transformation for choosing just the right topic for this season. I believe that today is March 26th, and so we are just about on the verge of entering into April. And globally, since 2004, um, when America set aside, the United States of America set aside the month of April as a financial literacy month. 
every year around the world, different organizations undertake the activities that contribute to promotion of financial literacy. So we are just discussing the right theme at the right time. I know that in the next few days, there'll be a lot more activities. And I'd like to encourage everybody to tune in to the various campaigns and financial literacy promotion activities so that together we can empower ourselves to make informed decisions with regards to our financing. Our topic today is on financial literacy for leaders. And I just want to give it a little bit of a background. Um, we are still in the global pandemic, which means that the way of doing things is a lot different than we have done in the past. Now, superimpose a war between Russia and Ukraine in the 21st century, and that takes the challenges, the difficulties, and the uncertainties to another level. And then we also are in an era when there are concerns about sustainability in everything that we do. And so we are looking at social and environmental costs versus benefits. Uh, we are looking at ethics and governance. This is the environment in which today we are going to learn something to add to whatever levels of financial literacy that we have. And the reason I paint this background is the fact that when you have a global pandemic of this proportion running into second year and over, and you have a war in the 21st century where the parties to the war more or less are major suppliers of global commodities, and also against the backdrop of concerns for sustainability in our activities. It's a whole new mix that throws your plans and expectations out of gear. And therefore, you have to be um, very sensitive. You have to be very wide-eyed uh, when you're making decisions, especially those that have financial implications. Because your cash flows, those coming in, and the extent to which you are spending is going to be impacted. Against that same background, we also have these constraints affecting deliverables in the place of work, in the marketplace. And so businesses are having a certain squeeze in their growth and profitability, which pushes them to also drive the key players, their people, to make sure that they are productive with every resource that is assigned them. So we are talking about efficiency and very strict performance assessments, looking at how people are delivering on their KPIs. And so when you look at all this disruption and the innovation that is required, especially in businesses and also in our homes, in our way of life, you cannot help but to also look at what changes you can make with your finances and in your financial decision for your survival. Against this background, we are going to take a quick look at what our theme for today means, financial literacy for leaders. We'll be focusing more on financial literacy and leaders because once we are looking at it, we are looking at the topic with regards to leadership, then there's got to be a reason, a special responsibility that you need to be mindful of. And then we'll look at where we are able to source financial literacy from, as well as some common terms that as a financially literate person, you should have at your fingertips, reports that you should be able to read and interpret. And then we'll look at how your financial literacy levels help you to build your business and financial acumen. Because in the marketplace, when we do business, when we take decisions with regards to our money, we need to show a certain level of, um, let me use the word leadership, a certain level of responsibility. You need to demonstrate understanding and appreciation of the opportunities, the risk, the returns, and the rewards that come to the uh, marketplace. 
and then we'll look at the impact of uh, the importance of projecting financial impact of your daily choices. So on the one hand, we are looking at understanding how um, our finances work so that you can make decisions that will lead you to a certain destination, more or less on the goal setting side. And once you have strategized, the projecting financial impact means that our daily choices, we are also able to evaluate how they are contributing to the achievement of the goals we've set for ourselves or otherwise. And I remember promising on one occasion that I'll touch on asset classes the next time I'm given the opportunity. So I'll touch briefly on that and then we would come to your very important thoughts, questions, and contribution. Now, when we talk about literacy, I remember some 15, 20 years ago, we used to talk about Ghana's low levels of um, literacy rates. Today, I don't hear people talk about low levels of literacy rates in Ghana. And at the time when we spoke about literacy rates, we're talking about the proportion of our population that we're able to read and also write. The same vein, when we talk about financial literacy, you begin to think of it along those lines. But this time, you would say that most of the leaders on this platform probably can read and write. They were able to understand the communications relating to today's events. They were able to log in and all that. And so they are able to read and write. And I think the way I would like you to look at it is that a financially literate person is able to read financial language and understand it and that they understand it well enough to be able to express themselves also in that language. You know, we, a number of us, Ghana has English as our official language, so we mostly can express ourselves. But when you come to the field of finance, the language differs slightly, and you need to pay attention to um, the meanings that we have tied to words that are otherwise English words because they take on a different meaning once you come into that sphere. And then there are some reports as well. And as a financially literate person, you are required to be able to read and interpret those reports in order to take decisions. For example, we have IPO reports when a company is going to raise capital, they are going to um, collect people's money so that they'll become shareholders of that business entity. And they do it publicly, sometimes with the aim of getting listed on the stock exchange in Ghana, our stock exchange is the Ghana Stock Exchange. The whole language that the transaction advisors and managers will use in that document is for your education so that you can determine whether this is a prudent investment to make or otherwise. Now, what people who are not financially literate will do is that if they can't understand it, they won't even bother. Thankfully, there are financial analysts and investors, investment advisors that will give you some summaries. But just like the same way that we have finance for non-finance professionals, let's say you started your business and you are running it, it's important that you don't just leave everything to your accountants because that is not your background. You think you cannot understand it. For prudence and for um, decision making, it's important that even if it's at a high level that you get into understanding. And so that is where you come in where, uh, with reports like this, build on your vocabulary, build your understanding on the terminologies that we uh, may seem to be bullying the public with when we speak our finance language so that you understand and you have clarity. It reduces your level of risk because you can make more informed decision. And um, the essence of boosting your financial literacy, I already indicated, would boost your ability to make prudent financial decisions, avoid some risk. It helps you to also build your business acumen. And business acumen essentially um, ref 
refers to your ability to understand sports opportunities in the marketplace and to know how to harness them by your day um, to day choices of actions and decisions so that you are able to generate a certain return for your economic activities. Then we also um, want you to take this session very seriously because as a leader, having adequate financial literacy would help you in strategizing. For example, every year, most organizations would put together a budget, which is their plan for the following year. In some families, I've worked with clients who put together a family budget as well, as well as some individuals that also have their own personal uh, budgeting time. And the better your financial literacy level, the more empowered you are to put your strategic plan together for your finances. There are many choices that you would find yourself faced with. Um, including how much money you have on hand in order to meet financial obligations that are falling due. I hope I'm not getting into the financial language too much. But what I just said, how much money you have to meet financial obligations that are falling due is actually referred to as liquidity the level of liquidity, how much cash you have in your pockets or cash you have in a bank account that you can easily access. Liquidity would not cover investments that you have in bonds or shares or fixed deposits that have a longer maturity period. And today I'll take my time to try to explain some of these expressions that I'm using. I also appreciate that you kindly type any word you hear that is a bit over your head in the chat box, because today that's all we are focused on doing to help you crack these seeming codes that we use when we speak the financial language. It also helps you, the essence of leaders having more financial literacy, that it helps you with business continuity and continuity with your own life success. Because you are able to strategize and plan your choices are such that you don't have shocks, shocks that will set you back. And even if you have shocks that set you back, that you are able to rebound or recover very quickly because your strategy has backup plans to ensure continuity. And so some of the thoughts I would like you to avert your mind to as we look at financial literacy today and its essence uh, the fact that you need to have curiosity when it comes to the basics of money. And some shared very beautiful introductions with quotes and all that. So I don't want to belabor that point. And I want to believe that most of the people on the call today are here because of that curiosity that they have about money. And um, when we talk about money and money management, the basic tool that we use is called the budget. A lot of us are very familiar with the finance minister or the deputy or representative reading Ghana's national budget. Let me start with what we mean by money. Most of us know money by the physical cash or the notes and coins. We call it the fiat money. And we also need to understand money beyond the cash and notes because the reality is that in any country, the volume of cash and notes that is going about is just 4% of the volume of what we call money supply. And so people have different bank balances to their names. People have different financial instruments and all these have values that are denominated in money. So money doesn't refer only to the notes and the coins, but the value which is sitting denominated in whatever currency all um, form part of money. And that's why we have the money supply. I will not get into that because it might get a bit complicated at this level. But just like some of you may understand money, 
um, demand for goods and services and the fact that when demand is very high, prices go up. The same way we can also have money supply going up or going down. When money supply is up, we are talking about more liquidity in the system. And when money supply goes down, then we don't have enough liquidity. And it can show in the rates of interest that is quoted in the banks and on investment return. So the price of money or the reward for money is like interest rates. Okay. I want you to just think about that. Now, when we have a lot of money, uh, liquidity in the system, it can also lead to what we call inflation because the system is sort of awash. Anything that I want to buy, I have plenty cash in my pocket. I don't think twice. And I hope you can read in between the lines and take all the lessons. I don't think twice before I fill my tank because I have plenty cash. I'm very liquid. And I know that tomorrow I'm going to be liquid. But against the context that I've just shared with you, I believe now when you go to the pump, in fact, just before I came on the call, I was um, in a conversation with a volunteer staff of mine who was indicating that there was a program that there was interest in attending. But then talking about impacting, projecting uh, choices, he looked at the situation and decided that mm, fuel consumption for just this one event, let me defer. Okay. So budgeting will basically look at how much cash do we have coming in from all sources and how much are we spending on all expenditure items. And businesses tend to do budgeting more and they stick with it, they would have a budgeting officer who makes sure that we are sticking to it. And when you go to the national level, we also have the office of the Minister of Finance taking charge of our national budget. And then in our homes, depending on how the home is run, you may have the Madam D in charge of the budget, or in some cases that I've heard, um, but in most cases, you have two people coming to put their heads together to put the plan. A budget is a plan, okay, on how you are going to earn money and how you are going to spend it. Saving versus investment. Saving, as you would know, is putting something away and protecting it. Your typical commercial banks offer savings opportunities. These days, some banks would offer investment products because they are working in partnership with an investment bank. But your typical, typical commercial bank would give you a saving account where you, they, they provide safe custody. They provide safe custody for your money so that nobody comes to steal it from you. And while they are providing safe custody for it, they use it. They create <laughs> credit out of it. So in any country, we have people that have money they don't need. They can save. And we have people that need money they don't have. So the bank becomes the institution in the middle, the agent that will mobilize the money from those that have money they don't have need for now and then they extend it as loans to those that need it. But when you are saving, there's very little risk because banks are required to have trusts in place to guarantee the deposits that you are making, that's saving. And so it's the reason why when you save, you tend to get very little interest rates. The bank bears almost all the risk for extending that loan to a customer. And the risk is that the customer may not pay the bank back the loan. But even if they don't pay it, it's usually none of your business. In, in a commercial bank, they are required to fall on um, the provisions under the deposit guarantee laws to make sure that you get your money back. The flip side is investment where 
an investment manager takes your money and takes decisions um, for your money to be invested directly. So the risk is on you, the one who brought the money. And so you will see that investment banks give you higher returns than you would get from the commercial banks because the person who bears the higher part of the risk deserves the higher reward for bearing the risk. That's the risk reward principle in investing. There are implications for your financial planning with this understanding. One of the backdrop, two of the, I mean, the backdrop highlights constraints that um, we currently have in the system. And we know that these constraints have implications for whatever financial plan that you are running for yourself or for your business or for your family. And we, when we talk about financial planning, I know I started with the budget and people may be thinking about food, accommodation, health. And I want you to also pay attention that your retirement, your mortgage, emergency funds have to also be included in whatever financial plan you are thinking of putting together. Let me add insurance here. And it's also important that as we go through this session, you look at how you can build financial resilience. You see, when you have just one source, let's say of electricity in some homes and in my home, for example, we have different phases for electricity. Sometimes a phase goes off, but some other phase is on. And so we can have a phase go off where we don't have light, but we have some fans working or we have bridges on or things like that. That's how I want you to think about having financial resilience. Your sources of income, where you make money from, where you generate your sales from if you are a business. That the more diverse the sources the more resilient you will be because then you don't have shocks when one is cut off in the same way you should also have backups like the emergency plan and so those that may be salaried it's very important that you look for other things you can do that generate additional income streams for you let me quickly add that as a marriage counselor also, I tend to not recommend couples to work in the same firm for the reason that they need to diversify their income sources. If your whole home is dependent on, let's say, crescendo consult, when there are challenges that affect salary payments, then, I mean, your whole household is affected. So think about it. I'm just trying to lay the tips and lessons as we, we go along. And so seek by all means to diversify, have different sources of income uh, and don't put all your eggs in one basket as we like to say in investment banking. Estate planning is a term that um, can easily make you begin to think about real estate, but that's not what it is. A time comes in our life, so this is the major life decisions when you have worked you have uh, uh, amassed some wealth and um, you're enjoying your retirement, but you have to also put your house in order because you will not be here forever. And you wouldn't like after you have left that there would be chaos behind you. We also have instances where we have wealth sitting in the financial institutions, commercial banks, investment banks, and um, the person who passed away has family suddenly thrown into poverty. Estate planning is where we take care of these legacy issues to make sure that a plan has been put in place to transfer whatever wealth that you have after your demise to the people that you have allocated them to. Now, as we go through the sessions, ask yourself if you have financial goals. Because of time, I couldn't let us have that interaction. But you can already let me know in the chat box. I believe um, the team will let me know what is coming in. there. Do you have a financial goal? What is your financial goal? 
I'm sure for your career, you probably set that by a certain age, you should be in a certain position or you should be somewhere. Some people have life goals, like when they are going to marry, the number of children that they will have. And I just want to know, when it comes to your finances, what, what goals have you set for yourself? Do you have a list of your income sources? Is it just one line or it's more? I'll be happy to see if you are typing something like multiple income sources in the chat box, five income uh, sources. That would be very uh, amazing if you have that. And then I want to believe everybody on the call has a bank account. It's very important that you have a bank account. And these days, I would accept um, e e accounts, electronic accounts, your mobile money as um, acceptable for bank account. And then do you have a budget? Do you operate by a budget? Do you have a savings account? Do you operate exclusively savings account? Or you also have some investment account? And remember the difference. Savings account, you are being provided custody and you get to participate, enjoy a little bit of the profits that the bank that bore the risk for lending the money makes. Whereas in investment, you have an agent in the middle who takes your money and puts your money into risk ventures for a fee and all the returns from whatever venture they put your money in comes back to you. Just the same way that if the investment or the venture is not successful, you likely may lose your money depending on how much risk there is in the type of investment. Do you have a mortgage that you are currently servicing? Or have you made plans for your own accommodation? Are you living in a rented premises? And if you are, what are the plans you have for the long term? For the long term because a time would come when um, you may be retired and you may not want to be living in the environment that you presently may be in um, sharing facilities because it could be more convenient to own your home do you have an insurance cover apart from your motor insurance which is mandatory do you for example have fire insurance do you have some health insurance I know national health insurance is quite cheap to renew. Um, if you are a state contributor, like it's mandatory for all people working in Ghana, that you can easily do that. I've had an experience where um, I, I had to quickly go and register for national health insurance when there was a certain hospital admission. And I realized that it, it, it was really unfortunate that at the time I didn't have my national health insurance. So now I keep it always renewed. And then I also want you to think about what the state of your health and the health of the people around you is. Yes, we are talking about financial literacy, but these are must-haves and you need to pay attention to the state of your health. Health is wealth. And so I cannot go through this without making reference to the state of your health. And then do you have a retirement plan in place? Are you contributing to tier one, tier two? Do you follow up with your employers? Do you go to SNET to check? Do you go to whoever your third party um, corporate trustee is? Do you review, do you take interest in reviewing the statements and the reports they send to you periodically? Does estate planning interest you? What legacy are you leaving behind? And for legacy here, I don't want us to look only even at the wealth, but also the values that you are instilling in the people that you are interacting with, not only your family members, but the people that you interact with. Still on terminology and reports. Um, after the conversation today, these are some of the actions that I hope you will take. One, I'm hoping that you will decide to take another look at your financial relationships. The people that you work for, let me put it <laughs> that way, at the end of the month, the places where your monies go to. 
I, I, I want to encourage you to take another look at it because hopefully today's session would have helped your understanding of the implications of your actions and that it would have also given you clarity so that there's no confusion, there's no ambiguity when you interact with the people that you have financial relationships with, including maybe your relationship managers at the bank and then your bank managers, your accountants um, at work and people like that. You would also need to reassess your financial outlook. I asked if you have goals, if you have plans. Are you servicing a loan? Do you keep borrowing? Do you keep taking your salary in advance? Are you saving or are you investing? You need to ponder over these things as your financial outlook, how you see your future financially. You'd also need to probably adjust your budget with all that is going on around us, you may have potential for your income to become irregular along the line. And if one side is going to become uncertain, what provision do you have to be able to stabilize your, uh, your lifestyle? You may need to reprioritize what is essential and what isn't. In financial language, we talk about non-discretionary versus discretionary spending, where the discretionary are those things that you can choose to do or not to do. They are not life and death. For example, entertainment, eating in a restaurant, a little bit of entertainment. Sometimes that doesn't break the bank. It's important. But when it comes to watching movies outside versus watching at home, watching movies or on Ghana television or on Netflix. These are the nuances that come to play between um, discretionary and non-discretionary for entertainment. Now, for the non-discretionary spending, we are talking about food. By all means, you will eat. And that is why I get concerned about Ghana's food security. Whether we produce the food, whether Ukraine is at war or not, we must eat. And if we can't sustain it, then we, we really need to take some serious uh, measures to make sure that we change the situation. You would also have to take another look at your relationship with your banks. Do you have only one bank? It will be interesting to know in the chat box. Or do you have different, I know some people, they have all organizations, businesses, they have so many different bank accounts each one of them requires them to keep a certain minimum balance. And so when you look at their financial statement, they have a certain minimum amount of money that you think should be able to support um, decisions and operations in the firm. But it's locked up as the minimum on this account, the minimum on this account. And so there's an extent to which having multiple bank accounts, even for your business, may become uh, detrimental. And then when it comes to investing, that is where we want to see you diversify across institutions. What kind of institutions have you placed your investment with? Over here, more can be better. You don't want to spread yourself too thin. And you also don't want to stick with just one financial institution. So you can benefit from the expertise of the different caliber of professionals and the variety of funds and investing styles. You will review this report. I already touched on bank statements. A lot of us understand our bank statements. It's basic debit and credit. Sometimes you are like, why is the balance like this? And sometimes you want to add debits that have accrued over a period, debit entries, versus the credit entries and what the balance, or you're expecting some money and maybe the partner sending the money has told you they've remitted it and you look on your balance and it's not there and you're becoming fretful. It may uh, be in the process of being processed. There may be some back end um, 
transactions that need to be completed before you will see it. And so if you spoke to your relationship manager, they can confirm to you so you can be at peace that that money is definitely coming to you. And then we have analyst reports that will guide you to know that mm, the way the market is moving, it's better for me to look in this direction or it's better to pull out of a particular investment. But before you can get there, it takes being in forums like this, building your understanding, not being afraid to pick those reports, reading and trying to make meaning, trying to make sense out of them and asking questions. Then we have financial statements, which are three key reports. We have the cash flow statement, basically showing how much money is coming in and how much money is going out. And then we also look at uh, income statement, which is looking at the sales we are making and how much it costs us in order to make those sales. So that at the end of the day, we can determine whether we made profit. And then we have the balance sheet, which we'll be looking at. What assets do we have that we used to generate the sales and therefore the profits, the cash flows that we have reported in the first two statements? Who do we owe? What liabilities are behind whatever activities that we are running? And whose money as shareholder is also in the business? And are we accumulating some surpluses year in after year that is making our shareholders' monies grow over time? So these are some of the reports that you are likely to be coming across. And if you take interest in seeing what they've written in there, there are usually copious notes for these financial statements. Um, there's a lot of text, the auditor's notes, you likely will come across the CEO's notes, the board chair's notes. So you can read the stories there to understand where the numbers are coming from. Then it will take, for those who have a phobia of numbers, it will take the fear out of the numbers because suddenly the numbers begin to come alive for you. So still on curiosity about money management, I think we've touched on budgeting, saving and investment and um, the must have. So pardon me, that's a repeated slide. Building our business acumen start with being able to understand the various reports, pull them together and be able to make sense out of them. Even in your interactions, in the reports that I made reference to, as you read the board chairperson's report, as you read the CEO's report, they typically will touch a little bit on the economy and global trends and how geopolitics and how all those things may have contributed to the performance for that particular period. You begin to sense what opportunities are there, what risks are there. And in these contribute to building your business acumen. Once you've cited the opportunities, then there is the drive to see how you can take advantage of this opportunity. Once you've seen a potential risk, then you can ring fence it and put measures in place to minimize the impact that you could potentially suffer should uh, the risk materialize. And so on my screen here, I have a sample, very basic idea of what a business budget would look like. It's a sample of the reports that you should take interest in. And just basically, I've put some numbers, random numbers together. Uh, I know your business and small revenue standards. So this organization has revenues, the total inflows, they have multiple income streams. It's about 111,900, out of which sales is the bulk. But then the organization may also undertake some investment ventures and they enjoy some returns on that. They may also enjoy some fee because somebody wanted to tap in some expertise that they have. They may have assets that were revalued and the revaluation also yielded some gains. The question that you constantly have to ask yourself as you build your business acumen as a leader is 
how the organization makes money. And it's a reason why I listed a few of the ways that an organization may be making money. How do you make money? Do you understand? Does your team understand how your organization makes money? That by being rude to that customer, by not addressing a pain point of the customer, by not delighting the customer so that they come again and again and even recommend and bring more people, that you may be denting your ability to make money. How does money flow out? You need to understand this as a leader. <clears throat> because if you are making a lot of money, you understand how to delight your customers, various strategies, you have recurrent customers, your market share is expanding rapidly, but you don't know how to manage the funds. There's a quote that I love to use often, which says that, our problem is not really about making the money. It is the spending side. That is where we get exposed. And so as you build your business acumen through financial literacy as a leader, ask yourself, do I really understand how money flows out of my hands? This is also applicable in the households. How do we get money into this family? And how does the money go out of our hands? For some people, by the first week, everything is gone out. And I know some families where once the salary has come, then they have to dine out. They have to really blow the money. They have to really blow time, sikayemoja, as they call it. But then they come home by the second week, and suddenly they have to resort to all the very dry um, options. Whereas they could spread the frequency of the chilling over the entire month and lend it so they don't feel the pain, like what we call so so cheche or cheche so so. You can have so che so che so che <laughs> if you if you get what I mean. And you should always ask yourself as a financially literate leader, how can I recover quickly? We live in times when it's almost certain that there will be shocks from time to time. But when the shocks come, how quickly are you able to bounce back? If you have an emergency fund in place, that can help you bounce back quickly. An emergency fund is investment um, for an individual. It should be a minimum of your salary for six months, accumulated sitting somewhere that you can readily access in emergency situations. And for businesses, you want one that covers your cash flow needs for at least three months. And I think in the early days of COVID, when we had the shutdown, we really saw a number of businesses struggle. Some of them ended up collapsing because they didn't have backup plans. They couldn't go out to sell and they didn't have backup funds. They didn't have emergency funds. So their businesses um, sort of went under. I empathize with those whose businesses were so affected, but I hope that we will all take a cue from that and learn um, and put in place emergency funds for our families, individuals, and also for our businesses. There are income allocations that we tend to recommend for personal and family budgets, but when it comes to businesses, this will vary from industry to industry. <clears throat> But typically, businesses operate for profit. So we would expect that as a financially literate um, leader, that when you take stock of all the cost of your operations, that at least you have some between 5 and 20% that would be your reward for undertaking the business operations. If you are in your first to third year, it's okay if you are not breaking even, but beyond that, if you are still not crossing over into making a little profit, getting into profit territory, then you should re-examine um, as a financially literate leader whether that venture is worth pursuing. There are expenditure items that businesses need to be mindful of so that they don't end up in a situation where they have to incur more costs. And these would be your staff costs, especially the tier one, tier two, and tier three. 
for businesses that give some health cover for their staff and then also professional indemnity cover. It's an insurance that covers um, professionals who do a lot of, um, should I say, decisions that could cost their partners losses so that when those losses happen, the insurance can kick in uh, to take care of the situation. Don't be found non-compliant or defaulting with your staff's tier one, tier two, tier three, because when they take you to uh, the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission or when the labor law gets hold of you, you will end up paying more. So be compliant to start with. And then you have your other costs and I want to touch again on insurance and the emergency fund, especially insurance for your premises. We've had fire um, take people out of business and you don't want that to be your lot. It could also be water and all these um, could be insured to ensure your business's continuity. When we come to the family um, and... Um, I have on your screens a, a, a family or an individual's budget. The person is earning a media income of 1,900 Ghana cities. And of that total income, 1,300 of it is their regular pay. It's assured at the end of every month they have that. Sometimes they're able to do overtime and stuff like that, and they can generate 150. So tune, this, tune in and pick this as an idea for how you um, account for your diverse income stream. This is not very diverse because there are many more. I didn't add investment income. You can have investments that are generating interest and returns for you. I haven't captured that here. You may have uh, a book you've written that generates royalties for you. I haven't captured that here. Maybe you, you MC on weekends, okay? If you like, you can capture that as you over time also. And then other odd jobs that give you money. Sometimes people give you tips and gifts and we don't pay attention to. When those tips and gifts cease, it will affect your comfort levels financially. So it's important that you take stock of that, stock of that and factor it into your financial planning as well. And the typical recommendation for allocating your income in your budget is that about 50 goes to non-discretionary. Your food, clothing, rent, medical, education, transport, and all that stuff, about 50 of your income should be spent on that. And then for entertainment and other recreational activities may take up to 30, and then the remaining 20 may go towards savings. Some people will split that between retirement plan and then some investment on the side. And whenever I see these allocations, it's not a hard and fast rule. You can choose how you want to allocate yours. I like to draw attention to the fact that if today you are spending as much as half of your earnings to cover your non-discretionary expenses, and you are setting aside only 10% or 20%, for the future, which future time you may not get the odd jobs because your energy levels are down, you are an old man or woman. How will you survive on that? So this is the reason why it's important for us to sit down, craft our financial goals, and in the midst of that, let's be mindful that we squeeze how much we are spending today. If you can squeeze it to 40 50, then you can especially squeeze the um, discretionary portions for entertainment, etc., so that you have more going towards your retirement um, package. I just want to remind leaders that with whatever little that you have picked from the conversation today, when you have set your goals, your targets, your budget, take note that that is not the end. You have the plan in place. In the morning, when you wake up, there are so many decisions and choices you have to make, which will have implications for 
staying aligned or out of the budget and the plans that you have made. And so take notes and be mindful to project your, the financial impact of your daily choices. Um, for example, when you wake up in the morning, depending on the direction you are going, how fast you have to go, and how soon you have to be on your way, and the priority of the returns for getting there at a certain time. You may just stay in bed, get up at 7 or 8, call an Uber, or you may wake up a little bit earlier and board a trotro if you are in Ghana. The public transport with other people and you will get to your destination. It may take slightly longer. But if you set off early, even the length of time would also be cut down because there may not be so much traffic. And this may have implications for whether you spend five CDs or 20 CDs on your transportation to the same destination. So this is how our overall financial goal may play out. And if you are consciously projecting the financial impact of your daily choices, then you are more likely at the end of the day to achieve the goals that you set out for. So be mindful to prioritize and to align your financial goals with your day-to-day -day choices. There are a few principles and concepts that I would like to draw attention to. And one of them is the time value of money. Money in your hand today is worth a lot more than the same amount of money which will come into your hands tomorrow. I believe that especially in these times, you would appreciate what I'm saying. Because the money today, if you decided to go and use it to buy a, a tin of Gary, it probably will be 10 CDs. And if you wait to take that same 10 CDs tomorrow and you go to the market, maybe the Gary will be 11 CDs tomorrow. But from the investment angle, we look at the fact that when you get the 10 CDs in your hand today, you could invest it, you could turn it around, you could do something with it and increase the value of the 10 CDs. So always collect your money. It's good to be kind and generous, but... When you can get your money sooner, when you can get paid sooner, please take it. I'm not talking about salary advance here, but services you've rendered, etc. Don't give an uh, unlimited period for people, your business partners, to pay you. Or when people have done that, it's, it's forever. Don't be shy to follow up on it because the value may be going down. If, when it came into your hands, you could turn it around and get more. Be mindful that when we do investment, there's concept of risk. The, depending on the certainty of the investment that you are going into, it may be riskier, considered riskier or less risky. For example, government treasury bills. When you buy treasury bills, you loan money to the government. And very soon we'll look at asset classes just before I bring my presentation to a close. And for government treasury bills, government after government, there's that certainty that whether it is borrowing, whatever happens, you are likely to get your money back. And so the risk is lower. Whereas Paris, when you get in, I, I think, I, I, yes, I, I, I'm out of I time. We are enjoying the lesson so much. <laughs> uh, people are very paying very good attention. There are quite a number of questions. So I will just um, reluctant to bump in uh as our time is not a good friend at this time so let's see what we can do with the questions once you finish your slide and let's see maybe we need to bring you back because i can see so many things and so many questions coming up so let's see how you can wrap up and let's see how we can take some questions yes. well okay. five minutes be okay this is my last but one slide. Will five minutes be okay? Yeah, Please. that's that's fine. That's fine so that we can right. wrap up. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that nudge. Then um, there's also liquidity implications. When you are investing, there are choices you make that will hold your money locked up. When your money is locked up and you don't have liquidity, you get higher return because you, you've been denied 
that luxury of accessing your money. It's also the reason why bank savings accounts cannot pay you so much because you have that luxury of access. And then there's a term we call horizon. Horizon would refer to how long you have to invest your money for. Is it short term? Is it medium term? Is it long term? And we've observed that in Ghana, a lot of businesses tend to create a mismatch between their funding. They are doing sales. The money is coming in bits and bits. They have an overdraft account with a bank. Then they will go and take, uh, they take the overdraft funds and they invest it in a building project. It will take a long time for that building, pro building project to start generating returns. So you create a mismatch that puts you under too much stress. There is the choice between financing your business with loans, debt, or equity, owners that put their capital in. And you need to consider this carefully if you are running a business, whether it's going to be equity or debt. For the personal level, is it going to be savings or investment? I explained the meaning of the both terms at the beginning. And then um, all this come together with the kind of strategy that you choose, okay? So you project your financial impact through the strategy that you've set up for yourself, for your business, or for your family. And in there, there will be the people bits that I made reference to that you shouldn't uh, make those missteps with their pensions, contributions. You should have your business continuity plan, and then your sales and marketing should all be mindful of that tailing into the overall goals that you have set for yourself. Then I come to asset classes. Asset classes, um, <clears throat> people tend to think that, oh, all investments are one and that all investments will give you interest. So when you start talking about getting interest on everything that you are investing in, you expose yourself as far as your level of financial literacy. <clears throat> and so we categorize the different types of investments that exist. We classify them according to time, how long they take to mature, or how long you don't have access to it. That's the horizon. Then how much liquidity, how easily you can change that investment into cash in your hands. Then we also talk about risk level. Is it risky? How much certainty do you have that you get your money back? We also look at the level of sophistication. And based on this, we can classify all investments into short term, medium term, or long term. Some examples of the short term will be money markets. There are funds, certificates of deposits with the banks, the treasury bills, the 91, 182. So these investments tend to be less than one year, but more around the Six, uh, 90 days cycle. Then we have the medium term investment. They deny you liquidity for a relatively longer period, more than one year, but usually not up to five years. That's where you have your medium term. And so the treasury notes, two year, three year, a lot of mutual funds and collective investment schemes will fall here. And if it is not certificate of deposit, if it is not a savings account, you get a return. The reward you call you get is called a return, not interest. Then we have the longer term ones that will be seven, eight, ten years and more. Thirty year bonds exist. You are denied access to your money for a longer time, so it means you, you are not liquid for a longer time. The risk is higher, and so the return is also higher. You always get higher return for more risk. And then there's the class of properties. Uh, buildings when you own buildings and we have more sophisticated classes of assets but the recommendation is that if you don't understand a particular investment you are not even permitted per your circumstances to participate in it and so these would be left for the professionals this is where i would like to pause and take some questions comments thank you so very very much uh and uh, Doris, thank you very much. I mean, I was absorbing and taking so much notes that I even forgot that 
we had time <laughs> so but it was so great my apologies and, i also wasn't looking at the time no but uh, i mean i believe that uh, people on the call were absorbing a lot and i'm seeing some comments coming through already uh, so i will just quickly go through some of the comments and the questions and then um, there are a few questions so you would take you take them all right so um yes we have uh dennis from sakumono is on the call dennis thank you very much elkana all the way from tanzania elkana balandia thank you so much phil fojo from gumwa fete amel amel is here with us doris atta he says doris watching from accra ghana thanks for sharing and the free education programs may god bless you Osborne Feniby, thanks for the great education, he says. Uh, Fortress Agbota Sape says, great submission, loving it. Uh, Emmanuel Wulo Willington, Willendall says, listening from WA. Thank you, Emmanuel, all the way from WA, learning a lot. Um, Beneza Niyama says, very insightful. Catherine says, this is very insightful. And she says, Doris, I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> All right. Sure, uh, Catherine, the slides will be shared. Mami says, this session is very eye-opening to me. I need to take action. Thank you, Mami. Uh, Martin says, I have, I have more to do with my financial services. Great lesson, very educative. This is an eye-opener. Thank you so much. All right. Then Ebenezer to forces. Thank you for the insightful presentation and the question. So Doris, this is the first question coming. All the comments were commendations, but Ebenezer is asking, talking about financial resilience and streams of income, what options are available to most public servants, especially civil servants who are so limited by the nature of their work. So if Doris is listening, that's the first question from Ebenezer Yebua Tufo from Abuja. All right, Albert Donko uh, is here. Felix is from Achimota. Emmanuel Wulo is asking a question. My question is, is there a relationship among the different financial documents, income statement, cash flow, and the cash balance? Where is the income where the income is not regular? How do does one safeguard the savings without depleting it? All right, Doris, I believe uh, you would answer that. Uh, Douglas Boasin says, good talk. Albert Donko says, more golden nuggets. Joyce Edin team, excellent presentation. Uh, Jerry Boachidankwa uh, from Tema is here. Douglas Boatin, it seems the continual devaluation of the CD and inflation eat almost every return on most investment and even weakens or devalues the investment. What must the investor in Ghana do from Douglas Boatin? So there is three good questions there. Uh, I will pause there and give you the back the time to answer it. Otherwise, Rosemary Gazes is very informative and educative. Kudos. Um, and Teresa Kuma say thank you very much. All right, so Doris, we have three questions from uh, Ebenezer, from Emmanuel, and from Douglas. Let's see. Um, let's see how uh, they go. Um, we're trying to get, I think, all right, uh, trying to get Doris back. Her internet just moved. Sarah, um, yeah. <clears throat> any, any comments? from you while Doris joined to answer yes. those questions. Very, very insightful. And um, I think I have lots of work to do myself when it comes to 
<laughs> my finances. Okay, Doris is back. Doris, take us away. All right, Doris. There were three questions. Uh, let me pick them quickly for you. Can you hear me, Doris? Yeah, I've just turned off my camera. All hoping right, that that's it will fine. Save some bandwidth, yes. So no, I, I can hear you better. That's great. I can um, hear you better. Did you hear now, the questions? I much of what you asked. All right. So the first question from Ebenezer to four from Abuja, uh, he says that talking about financial resilience and streams of income. What options are available to most public servants, especially civil servants who are so limited by the nature of their work? So that is the first question. There are three questions so far. So if you have noted that, and the next question is from Emmanuel Wulo, Wulindor. He is say, asking, um, is there a relationship or is there a relationship among the different financial documents like income statement, cash flow, and cash balance? And he's asking where the income is not regular. How do you, how does one safeguard the savings without depleting, uh, without depleting it? And that question is actually followed by a similar question from Douglas Boatin, who is saying that it seems the devaluation of the CD and inflation is eating away every return on most investments and even weakens and devalues the investment. So what must investors in Ghana do? All right. So those are the questions, Doris, if you, you would help us. Doris, can you hear us? Hello? Doris, Doris you did us? you hear us? Can you hear? I, I've got two questions. I didn't get Boateng's question fully. Okay. But I believe we can start from the first two, if you can right, hear me. His question is about the devaluation and how it's affecting investment returns and what options we have. What options we have for generating investment returns? No, against the devaluation of the investments and the returns, because we have inflation and the we have devaluation. And the question, yes, sorry, the, question the question is on the, on the screen. The screen. I, I apologize that it didn't come through. It, if it can be put in the chat box, um that will yeah. be helpful assuming that you can hear me well yes for the is. first one mm -hmm. the sense of what i got can you hear me yeah we can hear you okay for for the first one my understanding is a scenario where the income is already meager how do you manage it so that you are able to invest and my recommendation is that we need to be creative. We have so much power in our mind and so much power on the inside of each one of us for us to harness, for us to look on the inside and draw out our creative powers. Essentially, we can bring things into being if we can think about them, if we can dream them, if we can aspire them, and if we can take action beyond dreaming and aspiring um, and be consistent and devoted to it. I often like to cite the example of a young woman who started a thriving business now, quite very successful, with no capital at all. All this person had was her quality of character and she was able to get a market woman to give her some small ingredients on credit she went and cooked went back to repay and to collect more ingredients until now it became so once you build your character 
So I spoke about health, even though we are talking about finance and I'm talking about character. Once you have built a very good character and you exhibit certain values in your lifestyle, it's easy when you have thought about an idea, a solution, something innovative that people will be willing to entrust their money into your hands so that you can turn the idea around until it becomes something that becomes the source of livelihood for many people. Hello? Yes, um, uh, Doris, we are listening. We can hear you clear. Okay, wonderful. So the first, that will be my response to the first question. The second question, what I picked was that we was is there a difference between cash flow and um yeah the relationship outflow? so when we talk about the relationship uh -huh. between the income statements cash flow and cash balance and where the income is not regular how do you safeguard savings without depleting it okay so i i will use myself as an example as a consultant there are months when the inflows are high for your business and there are months when there is almost no inflow it doesn't mean that you are not working you are working but maybe some payments even came in advance and so whatever the um frequency and regularity regularity sorry of the inflows it's up to you to plan it to allocate it in a way that steadies it for you you would recall in the presentation at a point I indicated that there may be shocks. There may be months when you won't get anything. Are you going to do so so suddenly che che or you do che che so so? I mean, so so is when you are eating the milk and honey of the land, and che che is when it's dry and you are eating popcorn to sleep. So it's up to you. Um, if you are a contractor, for example, and you get contract every three months, there's no pattern to it. You know that when it comes, you should put all of it aside, take about a third or a fourth of it for each month so that you can spread it over a longer period. Whether cash flows are regular or not, you have a lot of control over it. When it comes where you've seen the pattern that when it comes, another one is not coming soon, then you should spread whatever comes over a longer period. And then you are also still encouraged to find alternatives like investing a bulk of the money when it comes so that the returns generated can be an additional income flow for you. Then there is the, okay. Yes. There yes, is the last a question one. from Ebenezer to four that says that talking about financial resilience, streams of income, what options are available to public servants? Again, yes. here is where creativity comes in. You, you could be on um, controller and accountant general's records and you go to work and physically you are there, your mind is there. And in the course of the day, when you go on break, you can be talking to somebody about some network marketing products. When you have clothes on Sundays, when you go to church during the weekend, network marketing products, there are some that are cooking utensils like the salad master. We have those that are into well-being products, vitamins, etc. You could be doing some of that if you believe in that. So you can become an agent, you can become an ambassador, promoting somebody's products um, when you are off your regular job. And then when you have invested passive income stream, that money that is sitting in the investment account is also constantly generating some return for you. You could work on a book project when you are, I know a number of civil servants who have um, trained themselves, have doctorates, and they may be able to pass on this knowledge by writing books. So the book sales can be a source of income for you. 
if you have um, excellent digital marketing skills, you may become a blogger, you may manage somebody's social media platforms for them, for example. You may have speaking engagements if you're a public servant. You can also do emceeing. I've seen people with full-time jobs who do emceeing or play instruments on the side to entertain for money. So the, the list is endless. You just have to be creative around it. You have to also look at what you are capable of doing, what your interests, what your giftings are, what comes easy for you, your skills, and then opportunities that come uh, most easily to you. And then look in your network. Great. Then the last question was, uh, it seems the continual devaluation of the CD and inflation eats almost every return uh, uh, on most investments and even weakens and devalues the investment. So what must the investor in Ghana do? The depreciation of the CD definitely... <laughs> I know some people want to use their money to buy dollars. And recently in one forum I'm in, I saw a very senior person advise that if you have bought dollars, quickly go and offload it because something is going to happen. Please, um, I will not act on this and don't take it as advice for me. I do not encourage you buying dollars now when you don't need it. And I also don't encourage you to go and offload your dollars because i don't have any information to determine what direction is going to go but i know that it's worrying when you have earned a thousand cds today and tomorrow the thousand cds cannot buy what the thousand should have earned you today what tends to happen in times like this is that if the inflation rate is not too high and you get a net positive All right, sorry, it appears um, the network kicked off. Um, all right, she's back. All right. Let so, me go off camera. Yes, you are actually so, off camera. Um, go ahead, please. the value of your cd look for investments that will give you positive real return that means that the interest rate or the return that you will enjoy for your investment is significantly higher than the rate of inflation because it's the rate of inflation one that is eating the value of your money away you don't have any business looking in the space of dollar when you won't have need for dollar or some other foreign currency. If you would have to make payments in that foreign currency, then it, of course it will make sense as soon as you get your CDs that you would um, use it, convert it into the foreign currency so it doesn't devalue. But if all you're spending it in CDs, then you just want to look for investment options where you can enjoy higher return than inflation. I also recommend that if you have projects that you can undertake that need the money, you take those project investments seriously. So, for example, the price of cement is rising. Iron rods is going up. If you have some building projects, and sometimes real projects and investments can give you higher return than what the financial assets may give you. And so instead of saying that, I'm waiting for so long in a time of inflation when the opportunities or the real return is not that rewarding. You may want to quickly lock them up in actual assets or projects that would appreciate in value. I hope this helps. Um, yes, I think uh, I think that helps the idea of putting the funds in uh, real investments, looking for alternative investment. I believe the question I was looking at where you already have your investment 
and then things are changing. Um, what happens if you're it's not you're not able to quickly um, convert the investment, liquidate, and move into other things? I think that's also another dimension. If you have a few words, and by the way, um, we've crossed eight thirty. So um, if you're on the call, um, that's our usual close time. Um, Doris is kind enough to stay on to just address the few questions. So, um, but if you feel like falling off at this point, we are grateful that you joined us. We appreciate you. And uh, next week we'll come again. But uh, if you want to stay and uh, listen to the final uh, thoughts of Doris on the question that is on the floor, that would be great. All right. So Doris, um, yes, any final thoughts, um, your closing remarks? Hello. Um, Hi. Hello? Yes, I I guess the Hi, internet says uh, yes, we can hear you. The internet says they have served you enough. So um, I was just asking for your uh, your final thoughts. All the comments that have come are very great, great thoughts, very useful discussion. Thank you very much, very informative, and so on. So um, on the last question, I was just asking where you have your investment already in other instruments, and then inflation is devaluing the investment, um, and if you're not able to easily disinvest and move out, what do you do? Right. Thank you very much. I think that's a very good and timely question. You see, when it comes to investment, and I know that you would probably have one or two questions that was looking for a response like that. Where should you put your money? There's no place where we put our money and we go to sleep forever. No. Investing is continuous work. So when you invest in some financial instrument, you need to read the analyst report. You need to follow the market. And the market will tell you when it is time to move from one particular investment to another. So don't think that, as for me, I'm investing in this product. So for my life, that is what I'm investing in. No, if you do it like that, you won't uh, enjoy the full benefits from investing. And so a time may come when it would be prudent to pull. For example, you have a fund that you are accumulating funds towards a building project. And you have a situation like we have currently where we see a spike in construction costs. And if you have the opportunity to lock in, you look at the rate of returns on the investment versus the pace of price increases in these building materials. And it makes sense for you to disinvest and invest directly in the project. You should do that. Um, you have a car project, a car fund, you've been investing to purchase a car and you've reached a point where you may potentially enjoy the car now with some part deposit while you mobilize the rest of the funds. It would be better to start than to say, I want to raise the full amount because it may take you longer. The reason is that prices are going up rapidly too. So while you are trying to grow the funds you are accumulating, the price, the target price is also moving ahead. And you can try to cut the appreciation or the rise in the target price of that investment that you have to make. I mean, the actual project that the investing is aimed for so that you can potentially get there faster. So yes, if you evaluate the circumstances and it makes sense, but things like your retirement funds, we don't liquidate retirement funds. It's an exception. So whatever happened for your investment fund towards retirement, you don't touch it. Your tier one, your tier two, if you have tier three, try to avoid the temptation of touching it. You may shift it from where the return 
is not most rewarding in a time like this to where it may be more rewarding. Yes, you can do that. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Doris. And uh, I think we've taken enough of your time and we have learned so much. So any final, final words, then we will close. And uh, what are your final words? My final words are that the Bible says, for lack of knowledge, my people perish. And if we will all avert ourselves to learn, not only from the classrooms, but learn from our own experiences, many mistakes that we've made, the experiences of people close to us, People that went on retirement and suddenly have to be living in somebody's, in, in Ghana, we say somebody's mantra, somebody's corridor. They don't have a decent accommodation. Some die because they didn't have a financial outlook for that season of their life. You don't want to find yourself there. So whatever you do, I will say try and gain that knowledge, that understanding, that learning. There are books many books read them there are financial literacy programs like this one look out for them a lot more will come up in the month of april look out for them and don't only accumulate the learning to improve your financial literacy take action we like to say that usually it is good if you took action yesterday but if you didn't today is the next best time for you to take action the longer you delay taking action the higher the probability you will end up not taking any action at all. So maybe you've attended a number of such financial literacy workshops and then you make resolutions that you are going to do and you don't. Please, tonight after the call, pick your paper, notebook, put something down and take the very first possible step to get you closer to your desired financial destination. It is possible. Yes, it is. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Doris. Thank you so very much. God bless you. Um, we would like to invite those of you still on the call to um, register for the Growth Journey program. It's a 15-week um, program for personal growth and development. You have our contacts running on the line. You can go on our website and uh, our social media platforms and get more details. Every week we have um, a session for just two hours. You just need two hours every week and you have a copy of John Maxwell's book, The 15 Valuable Laws of Growth. And we sit around, we discuss, share ideas and build action points from it that will help you to become better. So, um, register and join us we are on the third group but we are building up for the fourth group so please uh, do not miss the opportunity and on that note i want to thank all of you who have joined we are sorry that we have to uh, overrun our time a bit this evening uh, because partly because of internet and partly also because we have a lot to learn on financial literacy and we thank you for staying with us. Have a very good night. And please go to church tomorrow and thank God for your life. God bless you. Have a good night. We spend a lot of time developing our professions. But we don't spend time developing ourselves. Look, as a leader, as a professional, you have to grow. You have to grow yourself. And to be able to grow yourself, you need to know yourself. A lot of us are not achieving the maximum we can achieve because we have not invested in our personal growth. So we are bringing you this special studies based on John C. Marshall's book, The 15 Invaluable Laws of Growth. And we're going to just spend time with you and help you go through the principles 
that you need to be able to grow your person to become a better person because if you become a better person you become a better leader you become a better father you become a better professional do not miss this opportunity as the master class is going to be very practical and discussional it is going to be a limited number of people so please register now to be part of the program